you so much. So, um, so I want, what I want, though, is everyone to leave here today feeling like they learned, at least learned one thing. So let's, so please feel free to ask these questions. Um, also, uh, I understand that th this room is about half biologists, half informaticians, maybe have not had experience in biology. I will be going over some biology, and I'll try to explain uh, through it. But if you don't understand something, please raise your hand and let me know, and I'll explain it. So um, when we're going to talk about using RNA-seq in cancer research, we've got to obviously talk about cancer. And this is a great figure that was published in Nature a few years ago about how cancer is formed at the genomic level. So if you begin to imagine right here, uh, as we start off as a fertilized egg at the point of conception, if you begin to imagine what it looked like when you're, the first egg was, well, don't imagine what it looked like when you were conceived, but imagine when the first, <laughs> when that first egg got fertilized. Um, we, you're, you're, you began, you formed a <laughs> diploid genome. And as, as this uh, egg grew into a multicellular organism, as you went from a fertilized egg to gestation to infancy, uh, mutations begin to form in the genome that collected in the cells. Um, first is this sort of intrinsic mutation process. So this is the process as the cells divide, um, as the machinery that copies the DNA continues to uh, copy the DNA and then be uh, put into daughter cells. Uh, mutations occur. These are just natural mutations due to the uh, uh, due to the any errors introduced by the polymerases that copy the DNA. Later on, as you're as you're born and you move on to adulthood, you're now exposed to certain environmental and lifestyle exposures. So this could be obviously cigarette smoke, uh, charcoal barbecue, um, spending too much time in front of a computer screen, whatnot, or cell phone use is a thing these days. Begin to add additional mutations um, to these cells. Um, that accumulate as, 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 as your tissues grow. And in, this is the picture of cells, and these little dots represent uh, certain passenger mutations. But what can happen, though, is in certain adult cells, as uh, the cells begin to accumulate mutations, they begin to accumulate more deleterious mutations. These are represented by these little stars, which we refer to in the oncology world as driver mutations. And these driver mutations begin to transform the cell from what we now have a normal cell to something that has now become more malignant, or what we refer to as cancer cells, cells that are now rapidly dividing um, in, a, uh, in an unhealthy fashion. So we start off with a normal adult cell, now to what's called early clonal expansion, which eventually becomes a benign tumor. This benign tumor becomes uh, further uh, mutated to become an early invasive cancer, then a late invasive cancer, and then what we don't want, and what unfortunately happens in many cases, is a chemotherapy-resistant cancer. And it's the chemotherapy-resistant cancers that are the ones that grow, metastasize, and then begin to evade other tissues and other organs and eventually kill the patient. When we begin to look at what happens now at the RNA level, so if we have all these mutations turning to the genomic level, what happens at the RNA level is what we have is a very widespread dysregulation of the RNA that's expressed in these cells. And this is actually a, a plot from some of my work. Um, this is called a principal component analysis. And each of these little spheres represents a sample. And what this is representing is how different or alike samples are in three-dimensional space based on their gene expression. Here, the samples in red are normal breast tissue. These samples in blue uh, represent triple negative breast cancers. And what you can see is the normals cluster pretty well together, the triple negatives somewhat cluster together, but you see this sort of wide separation based on gene expression. And what we begin to realize is that there's a dysregulation, get rid of this thing here, okay. that there's a dysregulation of thousands of protein coding genes and transformation of normal cells to tumors. Now, to put this in perspective, there's about 20,000 protein coding genes in the genome. In any given cell, about 15,000, 10 to 15,000 may be expressed. Here, in the difference between a normal and cancer, 5,000 of those are dysregulated. That means over anywhere from a third to the half of the genome becomes dysregulated as normal, normal cells become tumors. So I think this is really important to think about that, that these genomic alterations, in essence, cause a wide-scale change in the biology of, of tumor cells. And what these changes are and how, what their impact is, is obviously the focus of a vast amount of research, including uh, ours in our laboratories. So when we take this sort of molecular changes to the human level, um, obviously the combination of these DNA mutation and RNA dysregulation is lethal. Cancer kills people uh, because of these uh, deleterious uh, mutations and dysregulation. Um, the unfortunate part is that treatment for cancer uh, really hasn't changed much in 30 years. Um, there's been obviously some uh, uh, significant advances in certain areas, but uh, the mainstay, which is chemotherapy, and for those who are not familiar, chemotherapy are, uh, are uh, chemotherapeutics are drugs that target rapidly dividing cells, but they're not uh, specific for cancer cells. They just kill uh, rapidly dividing cells and thus cause tons of side effects. Um, these chemotherapeutics have really remained unchanged. So 
the most popular chemotherapeutic drug, paclitaxel, uh, first discovered as an extract from the Pacific yew tree. The drug cisplatin, uh, discovered at Michigan State when by happenstance, a, a PhD put platinum electrodes into a, into a pool of water and killed uh, E. coli bacteria, that was, and the platinum was leaching off the electrodes. And cyclophosphamide, which actually finds its root in nitrogen mustard or mustard gas that was used in World War I and World War II, and then eventually made a chemotherapeutic. Uh, the unfortunate part, these are probably three of the most widely used chemotherapeutics today, but they were discovered in the 1950s and 60s, and yet they remain mainstay. Um, so while drugs that specifically target cancer cells, so not, you know, drugs that are not, don't act like chemotherapeutics that are, are just target all sorts of uh, rapidly dividing nonspecific cells, but drugs that, that specifically target cancer cells are under development. Um, and there have been some great advances, but uh, therapies that drastically extend survival have been few and far between. So I think some major questions in, in cancer research is, uh, one, what mutated genes or and or pathways are critical for the development of common cancers? What are the key drug targets for the development of novel therapeutics? What molecular changes cause the chemoresistance that I've mentioned in the first slide? Are there better biomarkers um, for early detection of cancer? Are there better biomarkers for predicting how patient, the prognosis of these patients and their treatment outcomes? And I guess the most important question, and the reason why I'm here today, is there are technologies that can help us answer these questions? Is there technologies that can help us, uh, in, in, I would say, almost in one file swoop, begin to uh, learn clues or uh, to answer to these questions and to uh, develop better drugs and biomarkers? And I would say the dawn of the cancer sequencing revolution has really, I mean, what at least we hope, is beginning to provide uh, answer to these questions. So I think. Have you already gone through the history of sequencing by yeah. chance? Oh, okay. So, all right. So you guys are probably familiar, but uh, is there anyone in this room that's ever sequenced DNA using a gel? Anybody? All right, we got one. <laughs> we got one. Okay. So you remember how terribly laborious that was, um, and obviously um, the advance in technology is what really has spurred on our ability to um, to really sequence and understand tumor genomes, transcriptomes, and methylomes at a much uh, much uh, larger scale. Um, this machine here, the XL3730, was the workhorse of the Human Genome Project, and right now the current sequencers, the Illumina, the Solid, and soon the Pacific Biosciences uh, instrument are, are now uh, the uh, mainstay instruments for, for the near future. So when it comes to uh, cancer research, um, this paper here published in Nature in November of 2008 was probably the what people will refer to as the start of true uh, whole genome cancer genomics. This was the first ever tumor genome sequence done at the uh, WashU Genome Center. Um, several of the authors here, uh, and actually you long know them, Jared, Matt Hickenbotham, are uh, people we've worked with in the past. Um, this was the, uh, a, a sequencing of an acute myeloid leukemia genome, uh, the tumor and the normal, and basically what they, it was a proof of concept to show that first whole genome sequencing can be done on cancer tumor tissues, but also uh, it was the first truly comprehensive view of all the somatic mutations that occur in a tumor genome. A very, very little known fact was that this was actually the first female genome sequence also. So it was about the seventh human genome sequence in total and was the first female. So when people have studied cancer genomics, it's a relatively simple strategy. And so this is a strategy minus all the uh, analysis algorithms. but what one does is you sequence the tumor genome of the individual, you sequence their normal genome, usually from their blood, you identify the variants between, uh, that are in both of these genomes, you subtract the normal genome variants from the tumor genome variants, and now you're left with their somatic mutations that are caused by their cancer. And what will then be formed in many cases now are what are called circles plots. Have you learned circles plots yet? No, no. okay. So um, what this is is basically some of the next-gen sequencing scientists were left with a conundrum that said, we've got all this data for every individual. How can we present this data in one figure in a fashion that's understandable, that can be traded among other researchers to better understand their tumor genome? And so they created something called the circles plot. And the circles plot here is uh, where the chromosomal karyogram is on the outside circle. So each of this is individual chromosomes. And inside these little rings are the individual uh, elements of the DNA sequencing analysis uh, to explain the different uh, variations that are in the tumor. So for example, uh, the purple line here are interchromosomal translocation present in the tumor. The green line is intra uh, intrachromosomal translocations. 
This blue line here represents uh, variations in copy number in the tumor genome. And these several lines going out represent uh, different sorts of mutations, point mutations, uh, heterozygous, homozygous, large indels, and then small indels out here. But what's really neat, it's a really nice way of taking a single fig uh, figure to represent an entire cancer genome that could be understood by scientists. And hopefully, I think they want to know is this to be understood by physicians and patients. What was very cool about this sequencing effort and this study is what they did was they then took this small cell lung cancer genome and based on the average number of cigarettes that this patient specifically smoked, they calculated that this, uh, that for, there's one mutation in the lung genome for every cigarette, 15 cigarettes smoked. So um, basically, that's, that's a lot, I think. I, mean, I don't know how many, pa how many cigarettes are in a pack, but I'm guessing you get one mutation for every pack of cigarettes. So not very good. Not very good. So. And actually, there, there is a, a, a software logic sample paper to go into so we can test the lung that information. Are there any questions, by the way? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think I think it would be probably one one SMAC mutation in the cell, in the epithelial cell of the lung for every 15 cigarettes. So it's not across every cell in the lung. That's a great question. All right. But I think there's some limitations to doing whole cancer whole genome sequencing. Um, first of all, uh, it's expensive. Um, is uh, this cost here about $10,000 per genome? This is the rough cost I just got from Howard Edenberg a few weeks ago. Is that it's pretty much the accurate, case, it's yeah. pretty accurate. And if you imagine you got the tumor in the normal, so that's about $20,000 per patient. And that does not include the cost of analysis. So you can imagine that the cost now becomes exponentially higher to do whole genome sequencing. Um, the second part with whole genome sequencing is that in some cases it can help direct administration of a drug, but in most cases it does not. So what does this mean? So there's this big push right now in, in uh, in the translational oncology world to sequence a whole genome and based off that sequencing determine what drug to give the patient. And the premise is if a certain drug target is mutated, you then give the drug against that mutated gene or at least in its pathway. Talking to a scientist, uh, to one of the scientists from the NCI who's doing this, he admitted it that there's only, there's 1,500 FDA approved drugs. Many of the genes that are mutated in cancer have no drugs against them. So you can possibly sequence a patient, see their mutated genes, but in reality, you have no drug to give them because there's not a drug against the target. So it's a great idea, but it's not really ready for, for, for prime time. And then the third part, I think the third biggest limitation to whole genome cancer sequencing is that it doesn't really give us any insight into how these mutations are affecting the transcriptional biology. You're seeing the mutation in the blueprint, but you're getting no indication of what it's doing uh, to the cell as a whole, to the rest of the biology. So I would argue then, if, if, especially if you're money limited, um, the best bang for your buck in, in order to get the best idea of what's going on in, in the cancer cell is to study the RNA or the, all the transcriptome, which is the set of all messages, RNA messages in the cell. And there's some benefits to looking at transcriptome, uh, looking at the transcriptome in cancer. Um, one is by comparing transcriptomes, let's say you compare the transcriptome between the tumor and normal, one can begin to determine therapeutic targets by looking for overexpressed drug targets. Uh, another benefit is uh, looking for early detection biomarkers. Um, there's a lot of people now using next-gen sequencing on serum in order to find circulating RNAs as biomarkers for early detection of cancer. Another one is uh, to potentially create gene signatures uh, that incorporate the entire transcriptome. Uh, so right now, a lot of gene signatures are just made with coding genes. With next-gen sequencing, you can incorporate the use of coding and non-coding RNAs to create your signatures to predict both uh, prognosis, uh, patient prognosis, and also treatment outcome. And also, um, one of the other benefits of RNA-seq is the ability to detect mutations and fusions and express genes to lend clues into disease causation, among many others. And uh, one of the other, I uh, forgot this part, but one of the, I think the other positive benefits with doing transcriptome versus whole genome is that your search space, where, where are you looking in the genome, is limited only to those areas that are transcribed compared to, instead of looking at the entire 3.2 billion letter long genome. Any questions? Okay, great. So if the answer lies, um, the answer to our research questions that I posed to you earlier lies potentially in the RNA, the best way to illuminate uh, this answer, in my opinion, is the use of next generation RNA sequencing. And why I like RNA seq, and I think you may have learned a lot of this in your previous lecture, is that there's a, a ton of really interesting analysis endpoints that one can derive from the analysis of this data. Um, differentially expressed genes, 
precursor microRNAs and non-coding RNAs, somatic gene fusion, mutation, splicing, novel transcribed regions, viral genes, if you believe there's a viral implication, uh, non-coding RNAs, uh, um, intrinsic subtyping, among other possibilities. I know um, Yun Long is going to go over several of these, I believe, next and week. And also RNA editing. And RNA I forgot one. That's why the many others there. Just to <laughs> <laughs> That's called the CMA <laughs> line. <laughs> so, so we've got the many others. So I think what I'd like to do for this next part of this talk is really talk more about um, designing an oncology-based RNA-seq study. So if by the end of this lecture I get you excited to use RNA-seq in, uh, in oncology, you will now know how to execute the study. Um, it is my opinion, and this is my opinion, that the most important part of designing RNA-seq studies has nothing to do with the actual sequencing. I think that's a really important part that people forget. The upfront design is what's the most critical portion. And a lot of people will kind of work too fast on upfront design, get done with the sequencing, and then go back and say, oh my, I should have done this. And so I think a lot of time spent on the upfront design is key to your success. Um, these include sample numbers. Um, I'm sure you can ask uh, Yoon Long how many people will do a three sample experiment and expect to get statistical significance. You can't do that. <laughs> you gotta have proper sample numbers when you do these studies. Uh, biological and technical replicates. Um, according to the recent RNA-seq standards uh, released by the ENCODE consortium, you have to have biological replicates. Any good high-throughput genomic, you have to have biological replicates. If you are in a situation where, you're, where your experiment doesn't allow you to have uh, too many biological replicates, then you really need to do technical replicates. The statisticians need to get an idea of variance within your studies to be able to do any sort of statistical analysis. So this is very key to a successful study. Um, tissue selection, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this uh, in the next couple slides, but what disease type you're going to use, is there subtypes of that disease, or you can use frozen tissues versus paraffin embedded tissues, um, tumor cellularity, how much tumor is actually present versus normal tissue in your samples, um, optical comparators, you'll, uh, you'll see a little bit more about this later, but what is your control? This is very important in RNA-seq studies. Um, I can't stress enough an analysis plan, sitting down with people like Yoon Long and bioinformaticians to really hash out what your analysis plan is ahead of time. Um, your translational endpoints, so if you're going to work in oncology, how can we apply this to the patient? And what is your downstream validation strategy? So once you're done with the study, how are you going to validate your findings from your RNA-seq? So I believe, in, uh, again, in my opinion, that doing RNA-seq in translational oncology is really a team science. Um, you're obviously going to start off with your biologist or geneticist or scientist who's going to pose the scientific uh, question, who's going to uh, direct the study, who's going to also do the downstream biological studies. Um, you're also going to need your sequencing center, which here is Dr. Edenberg and Jeanette, who do a phenomenal job. The next thing you're going to want to uh, get on your team, uh, next person, is a medical oncologist. And I'm biased because my PhD mentor was a medical oncologist, <laughs> and he's right there, and now my colleague. But I can't... Uh, I cannot stress the importance of this enough um, because medical oncologists are the ones who see the patients and they can help frame your studies, to frame uh, your experiment to answer relevant clinical questions. And so I provide an example that I've seen way too much often in basic sciences. So my example of a not so good experiment is using RNA-seq to compare differences in gene expression between benign breast tumors and malignant breast tumors. And you may say, well, Milan, that's a fantastic idea. Cancer is bad, benign is okay, we compare, we find drug targets, and let's go ahead and publish a paper. Well, what you, if you don't have any understanding of how, clinic, how clinical breast cancer works, you're, you're going to see uh, there's a lot of problems with this. One, there's several types of breast cancer, several subtypes of breast cancer. You're not addressing that question. Um, benign breast tumors can become cancer, so is that really the optimal comparator? Um, if you catch it off early, uh, a majority of breast cancers are really curable. So do you really need to do RNA-seq studies to find a therapy in a drug that's already cured, in a disease that's already cured by chemotherapy? So these, this is really a poor question. A I think a medical oncologist can look at your question and then reframe it and then come up with what I think is a better experiment. Using RNA-seq to compare differences in gene expression between ER negative breast cancer, which is a subtype of breast cancer, uh, ER negative breast cancer patients who develop resistance to standard chemotherapy versus those who do not. So now you're framing a much better question, a clinically relevant question. You have a subset of patients who do bad on chemotherapy, who metastasize and eventually succumb to their disease, and now we want to compare it to people who do not. That, to me, is a much better clinical question, and that's something that a medical oncologist can really do to help frame it. Um, you're going to need surgeons and tissue bank, and or a tissue bank. Um, access to patient tissues, um, and Brian and I can speak to this many times, is probably one of the hardest parts of getting a study. Uh, we ourselves right now are working in a rare breast cancer called inflammatory breast cancer. It's taken us a year and a half to two years just to get the tissues. 
even though we've had funding for two years to do it. So I think uh, having good access to um, these uh, clinical clinician folks who can get you these tissues is, is absolutely uh, pivotal. And, I, and obviously you're gonna need to get IRB and consent to do any sort of sequencing setting on human patients, human samples. Um, you're gonna need to get access to a pathologist. Um, and this is something that's missed out by a lot of people. A lot of people will get a tumor tissue in their lab, it says breast tumor, and you know what, it's not breast tumor. <laughs> I mean, I've seen this multiple times. And, you know, our biologists somehow just, are, I think, can be very gullible when it comes to getting human tissue. They'll just take what they can get and not realize maybe what they have is not really such a good tissue. Um, so my extreme, uh, uh, my very uh, strong opinion, and I think you should always do this, is to take all tumor tissue should be examined by a pathologist prior to RNA-seq. And why I think this is important is we're actually going to do an experiment here in this classroom. So by show of hands, how many here are biology or biology-minded folks? One, two, three, I think you are. You are, all of you here are. Okay, all right. I'm presenting to you here three tissues. I'll tell you that all of these are from the breast, okay? One of these is breast cancer. One of these is a pre-breast cancer called a ductal carcinoma in situ, but it's not a cancer. It's actually just a benign, at that point, benign tumor. And one is the normal breast, okay? And by show of hands, if you're a biologist, you know, maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but by show of hands, I want you to tell me uh, which one you think is the cancer, okay? All right. So how many people think this is the cancer? I don't know yet. How many people believe this is the cancer? Okay. How many people believe this one's the cancer? Okay. How many people believe this one's the cancer? Okay, he said it. <laughs> that is the cancer. That's right. That's exactly right. This one's the cancer. Um, the experiment would have worked better too, by the way. Uh, but uh, all right, so this one's the cancer. Now, you can get the, uh, you can get a gold star if you answer this next question. You normally buy a cup of coffee. Um, what? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> if we, what would be wrong with using this cancer in an RNA seq study? We're a little bit zoomed in, so it's a little difficult, but does anyone have an idea? Costa. There you go, exactly right. There's a lot of normal tissue surrounding that. So if you were to use this tissue just the way it is for an RNA-seq study, what you're really going to get is a genetic pro mixed genetic profile. You're going to get the tumor and you're going to get the normal. Now you say, Neelan, my God, that is obvious. We would never use a tissue that has a ton of normal tissue in it, you know, do this study with a bunch of normals. Well, I can tell you right now, I can think of three papers right now, Nature, New England Journal of Medicine, and PNAS, of people making broad claims on tumor tissues that now just recently have been rebuffed because it's found out to have tons of normal tissue in it. I think this is a very important process. A lot of people forget this process. Your tumor cellularity is, homoge is homogeneous, and we need, when you do your tissues, you need to really be, do a good job of making sure you have a high tumor content. Now the most important teammate, uh, obviously, and obviously the most important for this course is bioinformaticians and biostatisticians. Um, analysis is pivotal to the success of an RNA-seq project. I think you guys have learned this in your course already. Um, the involvement of bioinformaticians and statisticians at the start, of, you know, get them involved at the start of your project and not the end of it. That's kind of done often. Um, they are going to help you plan your sample size and biological and technical replicates. They're going to ascertain uh, the proper amount of read depth you're going to need to do your study. Um, help you determine the proper sequencing chemistry uh, and platform to achieve these analysis endpoints. And these are things that are done up front. I'm not talking about the back end, I'm just talking about the front end. And obviously, because of the many ways to look at the data, as I've mentioned before, uh, expression, splicing, et cetera, each analysis endpoint requires uh, detailed expertise. So um, I came up with this graph that says how a bioinformatician works, that the speed and quality of the analyzed data from RNA seq experiment is proportional to the expertise of your bioinformatician. That makes sense, right? But in reality, it's really proportional to how much your bioinformatician likes you. <laughs> and it's the honest to God truth. Uh, so I'm here to teach you how to do a study. And, and how many beers? And how many beers? Yeah. Right, exactly. So you, please take these tips to heart. What I'm about to give you: one, do not ask your bioinformatician for verbiage for your grant the day before it's due. A huge mistake. How many times does that happen? Every day. Every day. Do not put 5% effort on your grant for your bioinformatician and expect them to work night and day on your project. <laughs> not going to happen. Do buy them gifts. Too long likes Apple products. Um, when the and beer. <laughs> so iPad 3 and Fosters at the same time. 
you want to keep them long happy, and do keep them happy. I think a happy bioinformatician is a happy, is good results if it keeps a happy PI. So work together with them. They're your friend. They are people too. So let's do that. Um, and obviously after we've got the experiment properly designed and we've got the uh, experts assembled, you're going to have the execution. And I know uh, Yulong Long probably has already reviewed a lot of the details of RNA-seq, but I just wanted to give some additional tips to some of the things he had already mentioned. Um, if you're going to do RNA-seq, you're going to extract that RNA, use kits that retain both microRNAs and small non-coding RNAs. Why this is important, um, you know, right now with current next-gen sequencing chemistry, you either do the micro or you do the full-length uh, transcriptome sequencing. Um, if you ever want to validate uh, microRNAs down, uh, downstream, you'll need those microRNAs extracted from your original tissues. But I had just recently heard on the grapevine that there's going to be a kit coming out eventually soon that will be able to sequence microRNAs and full-length transcriptomes in a single library prep. So if you're preparing tissues right now for an experiment, it would be best for you to extract both because if you're going to already sequence in the next year or so, you'll probably be able to do that. So you want to keep both of them. Um, use sequencing chemistries that retain strands in this. Um, the solid platform has always retained a strand in this. Illumina originally didn't. I think now almost everyone is using a directional Illumina protocol. So most people are now using strands protocol. But if you're ever left with a choice, use a protocol that retains uh, the strands of the genome from which your RNA uh, is being expressed from. Um, this third point, there may be some here who may disagree with this, but I believe you should almost always use paradigm chemistries unless the read length of your uh, actual platform, like ion in the 454, is very long. The paradigm really helps you. Um, or at least what I've heard, and Yulong may disagree with me, but I heard it helps with both calling fusions, splicing, um, certain mutations. Uh, really, the paradigm chemistry is going to help you get those, get those analysis endpoints done quicker. And always, 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 with as much as possible, run all your samples together, um, meaning you want to batch as little as possible. So to illustrate that point, I'm going to show this example. This is a recent RNA-seq experiment of, in the cancer cell line. Okay. Um, the samples in, red, uh, samples in blue are done in normoxia, meaning under regular high oxygen conditions. These samples in red are done in hypoxia, under low oxygen conditions, okay? And on this PCA, we see a nice separation of the two oxygen status, here normoxia, here hypoxia. But you see this really large separation here on the x-axis. Can anybody tell me or take a guess at what this separation is? Long. <laughs> Interesting. That's, a, that's close. That's close. Interestingly, the number one source of variation isn't between this major change in oxygen condition, is that these samples were sequenced in May and this was sequenced in December. It's called batch effect. It's this idea in high throughput genomics that you can have everything the same, but if you prepare the library in a different room on a different day, whenever the moon is, whatever phase it is, you get changes in what's called the batches. And thankfully, there are software that help you correct for this batch effect. And when we apply the batch effect correction now, normoxia and hypoxia become the most important uh, discriminator between the samples. All I'm saying is that if you're going to run RNA-seq studies, always do them together. Do your samples together as much as possible. And, and, and the, if you cannot, sometimes you cannot, and you have to uh, balance the two samples. Don't put the, the blue in May and the black in December. And then when they compare it, you don't know what is the optimal. So always do it in balance the two samples. So you may do some of this, some of that in December, do some of this, some of that. Exactly. Okay. Is there any questions so far uh, on that part on designing the study? Yes, sir. I, I do have a question. So uh, actually, uh, you, you mentioned that you think uh, that pair ends are the best. I knew it. Are. I knew yeah. it. You know, you eat some. I knew it. Um, yeah, I know that the, I, I would do that if I have unlimited resources. But if my money is tight, I don't know, have enough for money to do. I mean, pair ends cost money as well. Right. So what do you think is the best balance to whether I want to go to pair end or I want to sequence more samples? Both. Um, yeah. I, I, well, you, ha you have a limited resources, you know, why are you asking? Um, I, 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 personal opinion, increase your sample size. If, you, if there's a choice between sample size and pair to increase your yeah, sample I, size. Yeah, I completely agree with you. That it, it, yeah. it, it, you also show that in earlier slide that it depends on the biological question you want to target. Mm -hmm. If you want to find out gene fusion, no you got it, exactly. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. It, it depends on your endpoint. It depends mm -hmm. on your endpoint. But if you're doing a standard gene expression experiment mm -hmm. and it, you have to choose between the two, then sample right. numbers are going to be where you right. want. 
Do they know? Do they understand what Paradigm is? By yeah. Okay. I hope so. You know what Paradigm is? Talk about that at least. All right. <laughs> All right. So what I'm going to go now into is I'm going to show two um, short vignettes of um, of some research that uh, my group has done um, in RNA seq and triple negative breast cancer and also in thymic cancers. Um, it's going to sound slightly like a research seminar, but I've put some teaching points through it. And it's being used to show an example of how RNA-seq is done in these tumor tissues and kind of show you what you can get from it and sort of our personal uh, successes and a little bit of how I learned some things the hard way. Um, so I'll kind of go over the, the experiment. He, oh, well, first let's explain what triple negative breast cancer is. So this is uh, George Sledge. He's the head of our breast program here at the Cancer Center with one of his patients. And every time a breast cancer patient comes into the IU Simon Cancer Center, their tumor is going to have a, a biopsy taken of it. And that biopsy then is going to be sent to a central lab to have certain uh, what's called immunohistochemical stains done to it in order to understand this, uh, to determine the subtype of that breast cancer. So uh, one of the first stains it's going to get is a stain called the, uh, for the estrogen receptor progesterone receptor. So a, a, a large uh, a large percentage of breast cancers overexpress uh, this cell surface protein, which is the, obviously the receptor for estrogen. And if a patient is positive for the estrogen receptor, they're going to receive standard chemotherapy plus drugs that target the estrogen receptor. So these are very popular drugs that target the estrogen receptor, tamoxifen, fulvestrin, and then aromatase inhibitors uh, targets uh, enzymes that produce uh, endogenous estrogen. They're also going to get stained for another uh, cell surface marker called HER2. Uh, and if HER2 is uh, overexpressed or over uh, amplified, in addition to chemotherapy, they're going to receive two, uh, they could receive uh, a couple other drugs, specifically the drug Herceptin, uh, which is an antibody against HER2, and Lapatinib, which is a small molecule against HER2. But there's this sort of subset of patients here, about 15 to 20 percent of breast cancers that are negative for both, uh, for the, all three, for ER, PR, and HER2, and we refer to these patients as triple negative. And for triple negative patients, uh, in addition to chemotherapy, there is no uh, targeted therapies to give this patient subset. Well, how is this translated uh, when it comes to survival outcomes? So this is what's called the Kaplan-Meier curve. Um, this is the probability of survival. This is the years after diagnosis of, can of breast cancer. Here are all, uh, all other breast cancers. Here is your triple negatives. And we can see that triple negatives do much, uh, have much poorer prognosis compared to other breast cancers. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that there is no targeted therapies for this subset of patients. So one of the problems with triple negative cancer is that our ability to define this cancer uh, is a bad start. So to best illustrate this, um, this is Brian, again, sitting right here uh, with one of his patients, uh, Rachel, I was, Rachel. Uh, uh, here, Rachel is uh, 24 years old. No, Sarah. Sarah, sorry. And every time uh, Sarah came into the clinic, she always wore, she made this homemade t-shirt that says, my oncologist is my homeboy. And, uh, Obviously, he looks very ghetto there, I think. Um, but anyway, if we look at Sarah and we try to describe her, um, we can call her blonde hair negative, brown eye negative, and tall negative. But you're not learned anything about Sarah. You just learned what she's not. And that's essentially how triple negative cancer is defined today. We define the cancer by what it's not, ER, PR, HER2 negative, not by what it is. So uh, triple negative makes about 10 to 15 percent of all breast cancer with a disproportionately higher mortality. Um, it tends to affect more premenopausal women and women of African descent. Um, many of you may have heard of the BRCA1 gene, which is a, a, a hereditary uh, cancer gene when mutated. Uh, it predisposes women to a much higher risk of breast cancer. Triple negatives tend to be BRCA1 mut uh, or I should say BRCA1 mutants tend to be triple, uh, when they get cancer, tend to be triple negative. Um, as I mentioned before, there is a lack or a paucity of effective targeted therapies. And as scientists, um, where can we look to better define this cancer and also to find new therapeutic targets? So what we did was, in our project, uh, we took 10 triple negative breast tumors from premenopausal women, 10 normal breast tissues uh, from the Susan G. Komen Tissue Bank at the IU Simon Cancer Center. And if you've been watching the news recently, you've probably seen a lot of news about the Komen Bank because they're tied with the Super Bowl and they're doing all these collection events with the Super Bowl. Um, it is the only normal tissue bank in the world. And here at IU, and it's located here at IU, so we took 10 of their samples. We uh, depleted the samples uh, for ribosomal RNA. I think you've already talked about ribosomal depletion. Yes, I did. Uh, sequenced it on the ABI Solid 3, uh, whole transcriptome sequencing. Uh, the reads were mapped to the human genome using a uh, software called ABI Bioscope 1.2. Bioscope is a software specifically designed for solid color space reads. And then that's, uh, the output was uh, further analyzed both using custom software made here at the CCBB and various third-party softwares from ABI, Partech, and Ingenuity Systems. 
going back to that point I made about uh, the importance of having a homogeneous sample, the, if you, well, so half the, the class would know that uh, the human breast is comprised mostly of fat and, and muscle and, and stromal tissue. Um, the, the origin of breast cancer is actually the milk ducts, which is these things here in blue. And we wanted to understand what were the transcriptional differences between the breast cancers and normal epithelium or the normal milk ducts to, to where, where the origin of breast cancer is. So to be able to do that, we took these normal breast tissues, we sectioned them in small slices and put them under a special microscope called a laser capture and micro dissection scope. And what we do is once we put it under the microscope, we take the laser and circumscribe these cells out of the tissue and this is what we extract our RNA from in order to get this sort of pure population as a comparator. Um, when we did the sequencing, um, I thought because we've got some bioinformatic geeks in here, you guys would love to see these numbers. But essentially, we had about 57.3 gigabases of the total data with 36 million mapped reads on average per sample, and our mapping rate about 63%. So one of the first things that was interesting when we did this study was we did a PCA analysis of just the normal. So we took the gene expression data from the RNA-seq and did a PCA. And what you can see here is you can see a sort of kind of wide variation um, in the gene expression among the normal tissues. But because we had really uh, uh, detailed clinical data on these samples, when we looked at a, a clinical, uh, uh, clinical parameter, we saw that these, we saw a nice, actually nice decent separation of these samples into these two cl uh, clinical parameters. So these uh, samples in red represent sa samples in the follicular phase, which is women, premenopausal women who are in days one through 14 of their menstrual cycle. These samples are in blue are women in the luteal phase, days 15 through 28 of their menstrual cycle. Matt, don't worry. I'm not saying the joke again. So <laughs> I have this joke that I've used many, many years that I told myself I wouldn't use again because it's gotten old. I saw Brian there waiting to laugh. Uh, basically, it means this is the first time. Are they time gene different? Yes, they are, okay. they are genes different. Uh, basically, because this is actually the first uh, study to do a whole um, whole gene expression profile in the normal breast as a man, I know the hu human breast better than women do. So um, that was a joke. Um, so anyway, uh, so uh, anyway, we saw this nice, uh, uh, nice separation based on this menstrual phase. The point I want to make for the teaching of this course is I think the accuracy of RNA-seq, which I think uh, Yun Long mentioned in the last lecture, is really powerful. And that this change in phenotype between follicular and luteal uh, in normal breasts is actually pretty subtle. When you look at the gene differences, the fold changes are not high. A lot of cases less than twofold, but RNA-seq has an accurate ability to really separate these subtle changes in phenotypes. Very powerful. Um, when we look at the difference between tumor and normal, obviously now we have this vast difference in uh, gene expression profile. Here we've got our normals, here we have our tumors, and as I mentioned before, there's roughly over 5,000 genes that are significantly different between tumor and normal, so over a third of the expressed transcriptome in these cells. So one may say, well, you know, Milan, We've had microarrays for 10 years. You know, people have been doing microarrays on breast cancer for many, many years, and, and it's true. So this is some of the very famous work done in breast cancer using microarrays, where when they took microarrays and applied them to breast cancer tissues, they were able to separate the breast cancers into various subtypes. Um, and they're referred to as the luminal A and luminal B, which tend to be the ER positive cancers, HER2 cancers, basal-like, which tend to be triple negative, and then this normal breast. But we've, what we've come to learn is that this normal breast really wasn't truly normal. It was actually, uh, breast reduction tissue, and it was comprised mostly of fat. And when you read the papers, they'll tell you that most of the genes that they pick up in this, in this class of tissues was mostly from adipose or fat tissue. So when we do the comparisons here, when the gene expression comparisons were done between these subtypes, these were essentially tumor versus tumor comparisons. So comparing one type of breast cancer to another type of breast cancer. And that can be very problematic because just because a certain gene is dis uh, differentially expressed from, an, uh, from in one tumor type subtype or breast cancer subtype versus another, it doesn't necessarily mean that that gene is important in tumor genesis. It could be a passenger finding. But when you do a comparison of tumor versus normal, uh, as I mentioned at the start of the lecture, by definition, uh, all differences have the potential, and I stress the potential, though, to be important. So the comparator is very important. And to kind of bring this uh, point home, um, a lot of people really forget that in RNA-seq or any time you do a differential gene expression experiment, your differential expression is always compared to a control, relative to a control. A lot of times people forget that. Um, so if we take this example of gene, like the EGFR, the epidermal growth factor receptor, and we say it is full, you know, expressed at 20 here in triple negative and maybe two or three here in ER positive HER2, you can say, well, 
conclude that in triple negative disease, this gene is overexpressed compared to ER positive. But now if you look at what is expressed in normal, now your whole view changes. It's not the fact that triple negative is overexpressed in, HER, in ER or HER2, it's actually uh, EGFR is down-regulated in ER positive compared to normal and triple negative. So always remember, full change in differential expression is always rel is relative to a certain control. And you see, you know, okay, that's pretty obvious. Well, how does that play out in the real world? So um, this is actually a comprehensive table of all of uh, several targeted therapies tested in breast cancer. Actually, all, all the targeted therapies, almost all the targeted therapies tested in triple negative breast cancer. And what you have here is the drugs, the target, the protein target, they inhibit it. And then I'm going to show you the rationale of using these drugs in the triple negative breast cancer based on prior tumor versus tumor data, what we saw in our RNA-seq RNA studies of tumor versus normal, and then, and then the outcome of the clinical trial, okay? So the first drugs here are cetuximab, which is made by Inclo and Gefitinib. Cetuximab is an antibody against EGFR. Gefitinib is a small molecule. We looked at previous tumor versus tumor data. There was a, uh, EGFR was overexpressed in triple negative breast cancer compared to other breast cancers. We were shocked to see when we did our studies that we did not find EGFR to be overexpressed compared to normal. Uh, actually, the full change it was the, the, the full change were very similar. P value not significant, and now three clinical trials all negative. When you look at the drugs of matinib and dasatinib, they are small molecules inhibitors of a, of a uh, receptor tyrosine kinase called CKIT. Also reported, many if you Google it, to be overexpressed in triple negative breast cancer. We actually did not find it overexpressed. We actually found it downregulated about sixfold. And two phase two clinical trials were both negative. Here we have a drug called aniprib, and there's actually a few others now. Uh, Olaparib also, both inhibitors of uh, PARP, which is a DNA repair enzyme. Uh, rationale to be overexpressed in triple negative, also its role in synthetic lethality and DNA repair. We found it to be overexpressed fourfold, and uh, one phase two was positive, a phase three showed positive results in the refractory setting. More results are coming out now, but this drug seems to be the least somewhat working in triple negative disease. So I think the important point is the normal control is vital, okay? What you compare to can have implications downstream of your drug development. So, Exactly. It's not because of the technology. It's not because of the technology. It's and a it's a de well, it's a design issue, but it's also an availability issue. The Coleman Tissue Bank started collecting core biopsies in 2008, Brian, seven, eight, seven. something like that. So the tissues to actually have the best comparator haven't been available when those studies were originally done. Now they are available. And so there's a lot of work now to encourage breast cancer researchers to use the normal tissues derived from the Coleman Tissue Bank for their experiments to have that optimal comparator. So as with any RNA-seq study, though, the validation of your results is absolutely critical. Um, the reason why is a lot of people can maybe try to downplay your results as saying, well, that's just an artifact of your sample size, or you're working with some newfangled technology. How do you know that's actually real? Okay. So we went on to validate this in an additional cohort of 26 frozen triple negatives and another separate, this was a totally separate set of 10 LCM normal tissues. And we did this then with RNA expression experiments using ABI TACMAN assays. And for those who are not familiar, in gene expression world, qPCR is the gold standard for gene expression. So when you want to validate RNA-seq, you want to use qPCR. Um, then we followed. And then w this is the RNA-seq results. Uh, I'm sorry, the ABI uh, qPCR results. And again, we confirmed their s findings from next-gen sequencing, EGFR not differentially expressed, KIT, the TMDC here in green is down-regulated compared to the normals, and PARP1 overexpressed. Um, when I presented this data, obviously the first question I got, well, what does it look like at the protein level? So for my thesis defense, I got it done for the protein level, and this is the protein level data by HC. We had antibodies for EGFR and KIT. We, there's no good antibody for PARP yet, but EGFR not differentially expressed, p-value insignificant between each other at the protein level, KIT significantly down-regulated compared to normal. So both at all three levels, uh, RNA, qPCR, and IHC levels confirm those findings. Um, I'm just going to show this real quickly. Um, I, I cut out a lot of the, my previous slides in, in finding drug targets. I only showed this one. Um, the, one of the other exciting things about EGFR and KIT as drug targets is that they belong to a class of protein called receptor tyrosine kinases. And receptor tyrosine kinases are proteins on the cell surface that initiate uh, large-scale signaling cascades that allow cancer cells to divide and survive. Okay, so what we did in this experiment, or in this analysis, is say, let's take all receptor tyrosine kinases in the genome, find out which ones are expressed in these tissues, and then do a volcano plot. 
in a volcano plot, plots the full change of the difference between tri triple negative and normal here on the x-axis and the p-value of that difference on the y-axis. And you basically form this V-shape where genes are most uh, significantly down-regulated on the left and genes are significantly most up-regulated on the right. Interestingly, KIT, which has been tested in clinical trial, was the worst. EGFR is here in this sort of milieu here. But what we had was this sort of class of receptor tyrosine kinases here, at this uh, group here, that seemed to be significantly upregulated. Interestingly, our number one hit, PTK7, was just recently uh, published uh, in, uh, by MD Anderson in the Journal of Cancer Research that when they inhibit PTK7 using sRNAs, it specifically uh, inhibits proliferation of triple negative cancer cells and not other breast cancer subtypes. So I think it's kind of a proof of concept that this sort of method of using triple negative versus normal is a really great way to find new drug targets. Um, the other great thing about uh, yeah. so, so I saw that test about Oscar and the PTK7 mentioned there are some some different targets. So how about other per, other person is that is yeah that yeah they are. Tai one is right now in uh, is it phase one? Genentech is making a drug against Tai one. At AACR they presented their preclinical data and they were working on a drug to get to phase one. Um, CSF one R does not have any current. Um, uh, Drugs, uh, drugs in clinical trial, but in vitro it does inhibit breast cancer cells. So it does FB4 and FB6. Are you familiar with if there's small molecules in some of these other ones? I didn't think so. Yeah, I, I'm not. Then you get the group. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, the other neat thing about doing uh, work with RNA seq is that you can profile the entire full length transcriptomes. Um, because Yun Long is going to go over these sorts of small non-coding RNAs, uh, I'm sorry, long and small non-coding RNAs next week, I'm not going to talk about them, uh, but I'm only going to highlight one thing I think is really neat, which is the ability to detect novel transcribed regions. So how many of you, when you were doing your undergraduate training, was learned that most of the DNA in the genome is junk DNA? Anyone heard the junk DNA concept? Come on, raise your hands. All right, good. <laughs> So what was really neat was this paper that was published in June of 2007, which was really just a, a landmark paper in nature, basically told us, you know what, we were totally wrong. There's no such thing as junk DNA anymore. That a large swatches of the human genome are actually transcribed, uh, producing a large class of non-coding RNAs. So this led us to take a little uh, inspection of areas of transcription that we're seeing in our RNA-seq study, but where there's no annotated genes. So you can imagine we're looking for areas in the genome where we see peaks of reads mapping, so areas of transcri uh, transcription, but there was no, no gene whatsoever has been discovered in that region. Um, we set some criterion for the analysis. Um, this, is, this was the preliminary criterion, which we're going to refine a little bit later. But 10,000 base pairs away from the nearest ref seq gene, just in case we were picking up maybe a distant exon. It has to be at least 50 base pairs long in the region with 20 supporting reads. Um, we then did some further bioinformatic analysis to uh, concatenate that data to form exon boundaries with doing a subsequent differential expression analysis. And what we ended up finding is about 43,000 of these novel transcribed regions. But at first we thought maybe this is sequencing noise. But when we cross-referenced this 43,000 against an EST database called ACEview that runs by S NCBI, which is ESTs derived from um, large-scale uh, 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 cDNA libraries, we found 17,000 of these regions to overlap current databases. So giving us evidence that these novel transcribed regions actually exist. The reason why I think we have significantly more is when these EST libraries were created, they were created using something called poly A selection, where the RNA was uh, derived from the libraries using primers against the poly A tail to get away from the ribosome RNA. We now know there's a lot of RNAs that are not polyadenylated. And in our chemistry, we used a ribosomal depletion, which got both RNAs that were polyadenylated and non-polyadenylated. I'm thinking, I'm not for sure, but that a large fraction of these are those non-polyadenylated RNAs. No, no. Intergenic, totally intergenic, yeah. Um, when we did a differential expression, we find 6,000 of these genes to be differentially expressed. And when we looked at the number one uh, novel transcribed region to be differentially expressed between tumor and normal located at chromosome 15. For those of you familiar with genome browser, you can see there's no UCS gene, no ENCODE gene, no non-coding, no transfers, so on and so forth. But what was available was um, a prediction that a gene should be there. So this is the ensemble gene prediction. This is the ACEview uh, EST database, and it's a predictive pseudogene. Now, I didn't get, when pseudogenes, a lot of people don't get excited until recently when a paper came out in Nature to really show that pseudogenes are very important in transcription. They act like a sink to microRNAs. 
So certain cancers, for example, will upregulate pseudogenes to get them uh, to, to soak up microRNAs that may be trying to downregulate down an oncogene. So there could be some importance here. I don't know yet, but we'll see. So I would imagine mm -hmm. that if this is the transcription is related to promoter regions, we probably will see some sequence for K4 markers. Yeah, you should. Yeah, you should. I, I have not, I have not cross-referenced this data against H3 K4. Yeah, but that's a great idea. Probably though. those those kind of attacks can be sort of open. Oh yeah, yeah, they could. Yeah. Um, as with any next-gen analysis, you really kind of need like one person to dedicate full time to each analysis. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So I think to say this, this idea of being able to uh, to discover novel transcribed regions from this data, uh, my kind of summary point is that there's plenty of undiscovered territory in the cancer transcriptome. I think we've just kind of scratched the surface of really understanding what are all the components of of of, of, of the cancer uh, transcriptome. Um, what was neat then, if we do a PCA analysis based on these novel transcribed regions, here's the normal, here's the tumor, and it seems to segregate the phenotype. But it segregates the phenotype with no protein coding genes, no known non-small coding RNAs, no tRNAs, no nothing. So I think this is quite interesting to see this sort of separation of phenotype just based on these NTRs. Um, I'm going to go quickly through the rest of this. Um, the other nice thing about from RNA-seq is the ability to detect mutations. Uh, triple negative is a, great, uh, is a great cancer to be able to detect uh, mutations because we know that TMBC tends to be familial, has this early onset uh, of, of disease which tend to have more genetic basis to it, and it has a higher prevalence in African Americans, lending more genetic basis to it. Um, we already know that BRCA1-2 mutations tend to be triple negative, again, lending evidence to the uh, role of mutations in this disease. Um, this was really inspired by work published in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple years ago where people used RNA-seq to discover repetitive mutations, recurrent mutations in uh, these two uh, ovarian carcinomas. Um, interestingly, this paper published in New England, the number one journal in the world, was done on four samples, four RNA-seq samples. It's absolutely impressive. Uh, but what they ended up finding, uh, well, I don't have the data to show, but they ended up finding a, a mutation, a recurrent mutation in a gene called FOXL2 that's in 99% of all uh, granulosis cell tumors of the ovary. So we thought, hell, can we do it too? Um, so uh, one of the questions with uh, limitations in calling mutations from RNA-seq, so this is the teaching point. If detecting mutations, SNV or indels, is your primary endpoint of your experiment, use whole genome or exome sequencing. I wouldn't use RNA-seq. Um, if you can do both RNA and DNA-seq, when calling mutations, that's going to be the best if you have the money. That's always a stressful, something like stress. Uh, false one of the big limitations of RNA-seq is false positive mutations can be introduced through the reverse transcription process. So when you extract the RNA and reverse transcribe to cDNA to do your sequencing, the reverse transcript base is not highly fidelitous, so it can introduce mutations during that, uh, during that process. Um, the coverage is not uniform in RNA-seq. Obviously, in RNA-seq, you're only picking up the areas that are expressed. You don't have this uniform coverage across the genome. Um, you can only detect mutations that are expressed. So if you have a mutation that's a large deletion, you're not going to be able to detect a large deletion using RNA-seq. And RNA editing <laughs> can introduce false positives. Uh, but nonetheless, you can do it. So here's an example. So this is an output from the IGV browser. They're familiar with IGV? Yep. So here, we're in this, in this gene, keratin 17. Here, we have a T mutation that's different from the reference genome. Um, so we did this, and we called these mutations, and then we put them into a pathway approach. And what we ended up finding out, so each gene that's in red is a gene in which we validated a mutation by PCR and Sanger sequencing. And what we realized, in one of our samples, we had a BRCA mutation, but in several of the other samples, they did not have a mutation in BRCA, but they had mutations in the same pathway as BRCA. So it was kind of this new evidence that we're hoping will be published in the near future to show that maybe for the rest of these sporadic triple negatives, these non-genetic triple negatives, a lot of the mutations may not be in the BRCA gene, which is implicated in familial uh, triple negative breast cancer, but for the sporadic, they may be in genes that are involved in the same pathway. Uh, actually, these are somatic because I subtract. Well, this is the, the, the tumor samples, but uh, this yeah. is not really the somatic mutations that. So you are looking for the family and the, and the justification. Yeah, I, I didn't because for the sake of time, I took out sort of the process. Yeah. Um, but essentially, we called mutations and then we subtracted any mutation that was in DB SNP or Thousand Genomes Project. So we got rid of a lot of these common germline yeah. variants. So. But this could still be it, it could be. It could be. It, it could be. Yes. 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 
Uh, no, not necessarily. Sometimes it's 20%, sometimes it's 90% of the tumor will have that semaglutation. It, it varies. It varies. Yeah. Um, oh, and just to show, uh, based on that gene expression platform I showed you, we, we came out when we did the analysis. It was interesting. We always had this one sample, and for two years we never knew why the sample was away until we did was away from the group until we did the mutation analysis, and this one was actually a BRCA1 mutant, separated itself from the rest of the pack. Uh, one, the last analysis we hear, we're going to show here with the triple negative is the ability to look for gene fusions. I think Yun Long is going to talk about this next week, so I won't go too much into detail, but gene fusions are essentially when cancers will take two genes, usually located on separate chromosomes or sometimes on the same chromosome, and fuse the genes together to form sort of a super oncogenic protein. Um, and we were able to use this technology to detect gene fusions that were expressed in triple negative breast cancer. So here is the first gene and its exon being fused to the second gene and its exon and whether that fusion was an inter and intrachromosomal. And we spent a lot of time in this hoping to find a recurrent gene fusion triple negative as a potential drug target. We, we actually did not. Uh, what it come, our data seems to support and actually support data from other groups that in triple negative breast cancer, there's a ton of gene fusions, but they're more random. They're never the same. Uh, for each patient, and they're never, this, uh, they're, they're different for each patient. So each kind of patient has their own personal gene fusion. Um, my second example here for RNA-seq is going to be in thymic malignancies. This is actually a pretty short vignette, but I wanted to show it just to, uh, to um, illustrate one example. Uh, so in this study, we took 13 thymus cancers spread across uh, uh, histological subtypes. Um, hold on, let me ask first. Does anyone, does everyone know what the thymus gland is? Okay. When I tell my friends, like, like people who aren't scientists, they don't know what a thymus is, so I better ask. So a thymus is a gland up here, and it's important for maturation of your immune cells. And it's a very rare cancer. There's only about 500 cases in the U.S. per year, and half the cases in the U.S. per year are seen here at IU because Pat Lair, our cancer center director, is a world expert in thymoma. So he wanted to use this technology in this cancer to see if we can begin to understand its causation and hopefully further drug treatments. So we took 13 uh, thymic cancers spread across subtypes, three uh, uh, thymuses from normal juvenile cases, again, sequenced on the solid uh, three plus, mapped to, uh, read for, with ABI Bioscope and then did the software analysis. And I think Yun Long showed this figure at your last lecture, but it's worth mentioning again. Um, when, we did the diff when we did the hierarchical clustering of the samples, so here are the samples. This is the different subtypes of thymoma, uh, referred to as A, A, B, B3, normal. We saw this beautiful separation of the tumor subtypes, uh, of the thymoma subtypes uh, based on their gene expression. So here are the A's, here are the AB's, here are the B3's normal. Um, sorry, I should go back. And then, I'm missing a box. And then the C's and B2. Um, why this was really interesting, um, I'm missing sure, is that it really shows that RNA-seq seems to be an extremely accurate technology. Uh, on microarrays, you would never see that sort of separation. I don't think you would. I don't think you can. I think my experience, the RNA seek seems to be able to discriminate these phenotypes quite well. Um, and the reason why we were kind of excited about this, you may say, well, Milan, you know, why do you need to do high expensive RNA seq experiment if you can determine the subtype by looking under a microscope? Well, the only reason why we are able to do it well here is because we have a very talented pathologist who's able to, who knows thymoma quite well. But if you can imagine a patient in Colorado who may not have access to that expertise, subtyping of this tumor is very, very difficult. So, um, and interestingly, three out of 13 tumors that we had done were reclassified based on our data, and really their, their patient chart was changed here in the Clarion IU Health database uh, when, once we did the RNA-seq. So um, we are actually now, right now, potentially working on sort of a diagnostic tool to use RNA, a, a qPCR diagnostic tool to better uh, subtype these thymomas. So I think in summary, uh, Next-gen sequencing is uh, revolutionizing cancer research through the sequencing of cancer genomes, transcriptomes, and methylomes. Um, as I stressed before, I think a team of cancer researchers is absolutely critical to the success of these studies. Um, you obviously you need to get your researchers, your clinicians, and your bioverticians uh, on board prior to the execution of your study. Uh, good study design, sample prep, and bioinformatics is are, uh, analysis are critical for the success. And obviously, the beautiful thing about being able to do RNA-seq or any of these next-gen sequencing is the number of endpoints that you can then analyze, specifically, obviously, novel targets, cancer-causing mutations, subtyping, development of circulating biomarkers, among a large list of others, but these are a few of my favorite. Um, because I showed original data, but also the stress, this is the team that I've been blessed to work with. Um, I mentioned the importance of the team, and this is where I'm at. So let me start off with Brian Schneider, who is my uh, 
PhD mentor, now my colleague, who's a medical oncologist, but we have more medical oncologists, Brian Schneider, George Sledge, Pat Lair, Ken Tesler, and Maria Storniolo. Uh, bioinformatics, the venerable Yun Long Lu, uh, Marcus Brees, uh, Jared Glasscock, and then several people from Pi Biosystems who helped us specifically with diffusion analysis. Um, our surgeons, Sue Claire, Bob Boulay, and Ken Tesler, who helped us get the tissues, and then the tissue bank and the normal tissue bank. Our pathologist, Sunil Bhadde, where he is, he is very, uh, very, very talented pathologist. And then our many biologists who, uh, who provide additional assistance, Vachea Ivan, Brad Hancock, Nawal Kasim, and several folks in the Coleman Tissue Bank. As you can see, these good successful studies take a lot of good talented people working together to, to the common endpoint, and that's going to be the success of your RNA-seq studies. So that's it. So. So uh, let me ask you one question. Yes, sir. If you have unlimited resources, if you can sequencing everything, yeah. what, what is the experiment you're going to do? I would sequence everybody. You're sequence everybody. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, you told me unlimited resources. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you're talking about the ultimate cancer experiment, oh, per yeah. se? Yeah. yeah, you know, I, we thought about that. Now, there are major worldwide consortiums right now doing the ultimate uh, experiment, the International Cancer Genome Consortium and the Cancer Genome Atlas of the NCI. And right now, they're, they're charged with sequencing 25,000 tumor genomes, tumor normal, and their transcriptomes across a variety of the 20 most common cancers uh, in the world. To me, that's the ultimate experiment, being paid by your tax dollars. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> I don't know where that goes anyway. Uh, All right, and a, a second question is, how do you think that the, the development of third generation sequencing can potentially improve your, your research? In the RNA world? In the, in the, in the, yeah, I, well, first of all, um, I, I got, just got some recent insight from the third generation. I was asking for an update on Visigen and Pat. So it seems like they're having a lot of problems even getting these platforms off the ground. There's having some significant issues. So I don't, we'll see how long it will take. Um, the beauty of, of, especially in RNA, of third gen sequencing technology is that it's amplification free. So you're, re you're removing any biases that may be added by the uh, amplification. You also get rid of the reverse, well, I'm sorry, you get rid of any PCR induced mutations that cause false positives in your mutation calling. So I think the implication of third gen is more accurate mutation calling and potentially better differential expression and faster. That, that was my interrogation. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs>